After making my recent video about what orcs are, I got to thinking about kobolds. They're also a monster that has changed quite a bit over time. Much like what we saw with the orcs, kobolds have origins that stretch back to early medieval times and even the ancient world. In contemporary times, games like Dungeons & Dragons, World of Warcraft, EverQuest, and Final Fantasy have created their own takes on kobolds, which are inspired by these legends of yore, but also they reinterpret them in different ways. D&D has popularized the kobold to a high degree, but how did this creature actually begin? What is a kobold, really? Before we delve too deeply into this dungeon, please take a moment to raise your thumb of glory and give this video a like. If you're not subscribed yet, please take a quick second to do so. It really helps to let me know that you enjoy these kinds of monstrous explorations. Getting to the very root of the kobold is something of a difficult task. Things get hazy when we go back that far into the past, but it's so interesting to see how these cultural tropes and myths got their beginnings. For sure, the kobold is found in Germanic mythology, which, along with the related Norse mythology, gives us creatures like dwarves, elves, and giants. The original description of a kobold here is a kind of sprite, so a little spirit, like a little fairy spirit. Kobolds didn't have one set appearance. They could take on the shape of an animal, or a tiny humanoid, or even a flame. But they could just as easily be invisible. They lived in homes, they lived underground, in mines, sometimes aboard ships. Like goblins, they were also known as mischievous things, pranksters, though in some circumstances they would assist with household tasks. Some historians believe that the Germanic kobold actually traces back to classical antiquity from the ancient Greek kobalos, or in plural, kobaloi, which is essentially the same creature. They're little sprites, roguish, shameless tricksters, but their antics could be considered amusing at times. They were associated with the god Dionysus, whose domains were things like wine, parties, ritual ecstasy, and insanity. It is possible that this concept spread across Europe during the Middle Ages and evolved into things like the kobold, goblin, boggart, boggle, and puck. There's a lot of similarities in their descriptions, in their stories, and even in their names. I've searched for texts containing the original myths of the Kobaloi, including one in which they supposedly rob Hercules, but these texts have proven highly elusive and difficult to find. So let's jump back to the Germanic Kobold. The Kobolds there were categorized in three different types, Wood Kobolds, Cave Kobolds, and Sea Kobolds. The Wood or Forest Kobolds were often solitary household spirits, and people were known to give them little gifts in exchange for their help, or at least to keep them pleased. The cave, or subterranean kobolds, lived in groups. They had communities of their own, but they would come across humans who were down there mining. Sometimes these kobolds helped the miners find veins of valuable ore, but other times they harmed the miners, causing collapsing tunnels, causing accidents, or poisoning ores. In fact, the mineral cobalt which is toxic, gets its name from the kobold. And last, but not least, the sea or ship kobolds hid away on ocean-faring vessels, likely because they dwelled within the wood that was used to build the ship. Like the others, they often assisted the human sailors in keeping the ship in good repair, but they wished to remain hidden. It was taboo to see this kind of kobold, and doing so would cause the peeping sailor to die, or even worse, the whole ship to sink if the kobold was greatly enraged. So I see the kobold as an imaginative representation of things like tools and technology, of maintenance and invention. Think about how we all have our tasks that we must perform in order to keep up our lives. We have our household chores to do, cleaning and fixing, and organizing and prioritizing. And on top of that, we have our ingenuity when we come up with new solutions or even new technology to accomplish such things. 
And all of these behaviors have an origin in nature, in plants, in mineral, in water. But there are some catches to this. There are some caveats. For one, you have to keep up with it all. If you just let things go, the kobolds get angry. They don't like being neglected or unappreciated. Things start breaking down and maybe accidents happen. Traps get laid and then we fall into them. Another catch is that our tools and our technology can be misused. They can kill us. We all know somebody that got hurt because they weren't paying enough attention while they were working with tools. And we've all felt the temptation to do something malicious or unethical with tools or technology. We all have a kobold in our mind, you could say. In one mode, we are industrious workers. In another mode, we want to joke around and play pranks. And in another, darker mode, we have a capacity for cruelty or selfishness. And if we trespass too far, if we break the time-honored rule and we gawk at that kobold who wants to remain unseen, our house might fall, our mine shaft might collapse, our ship might sink. In Dungeons & Dragons, the kobold is one of the most prominent kinds of monsters in the game, especially during the low levels. First level characters fighting kobolds is right up there with facing goblins, giant rats, wolves, and skeletons. Though it's easy enough to feature kobolds at mid-levels too. D&D was the first role-playing game ever. It came about during the 1970s. It has roots in wargaming, though it took lots of inspiration from fantasy literature and mythology. Creators Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson drew from the Germanic sprite kobold, particularly the subterranean variety, and they made some certain alterations. Then over the additions and with the change of game designers, the kobold's appearance went through some substantial modifications. In the original D&D set, 1974's White Box, kobolds are similar to goblins, just a bit weaker. In first edition Advanced Dungeons & Dragons, their appearance became more unique. Still small things that live in dark places and are fond of traps and ambushing, but no longer quite so goblin-like. They're more scaly dog-rat people. The second edition kobold looks even more rat-like, and its main image shows it holding a scorpion on a stick, illustrating the kobold race as vermin keepers. Kobold traps are just as likely to dump stinging, biting bugs onto you as they are to stab you with spikes or drop you into a pit. The third edition kobold reimagined them once again, making them a kind of dragonkin, a race of lesser draconic humanoids. From this point on, the kobolds as dragonkin aesthetic stuck, and it continues on through 5th edition. The Pathfinder tabletop RPG began as a modified form of 3.5 D&D, and it kept the draconic reptilian look to the kobold. Just like how Warhammer and Warcraft popularized the notion that orcs are green-skinned people, it seems that D&D has popularized the notion that kobolds are little dragon people. But there are different kinds of kobolds in other games, World of Warcraft being a good example. In that setting, kobolds still have the characteristic of dwelling underground and mining, but they have a rodent-like appearance. They also have an immense affinity for their precious candles. Whereas in D&D, kobolds are nasty things that are typically lawful evil in alignment, WoW kobolds are more on the neutral side, they're more timid and cowardly, sometimes they're even the victims of more cruel races such as the gnolls. They also have something of an elemental connection, particularly with the element of earth. Sometimes they are wielding elemental magic and some of the Warcraft lore indicates that they might have been spawned during the primordial beginnings of the world of Azeroth. Curiously, the Warcraft kobold is a bit closer to the classic kobold from Germanic lore than the contemporary D&D kobold is. Also, like what we saw with the orc, in the current state of D&D, the kobold is seen by some as a player character race. Now, of course, in 3E and 4E, there was information about how to make a kobold character, 
but it was pretty rare that someone did so, and such rules were just as likely to be utilized by a game master wanting to make kobold NPCs. 5e takes things further. It puts kobold character stats alongside those of other player character races in the books Volo's Guide to Monsters and Mordenkainen Presents Monsters of the Multiverse. Some people do enjoy this, though it also comes with a number of problems from trying to fit a monster into the mold of a typical humanoid. As a quick tangent, I'm working on a creative solution to this kind of issue, which is to make monsters playable as characters. Full monsters with all kinds of fantastic abilities. I will soon be launching a Kickstarter for a 5e book called Monstrous Heroes. It is slated to feature 14 different monster classes, plus a few more as stretch goals. In this supplement, each monstrous option serves as both your race slash species and your class. That's right, I'm bringing back race classes. This way, you get the best of both worlds. You get the familiar structure of a 5e character, and you can play the full-on monsters like Minotaur, Vampire, Ogre, and Dragon without having to always be stuck within the arbitrary limitations of the normal humanoid options. So go check out the Kickstarter page pre-launch, make sure to hit the follow there, and grab the preview PDF. It gives you everything you need to play up to 12th level in the beta versions of three monster classes. The link is down in the video description. So let's talk about why kobolds pose certain problems as a player character race. See. The kobold is a scrawny, little, two to three foot tall thing. It's like the size of a two year old. So there is an obvious physical disadvantage there. They are agile, so that is an advantage, but otherwise they're known to be frail. In 3e D&D, a kobold character had negative four strength and negative two constitution, along with a plus two dexterity. A player who is more into role-playing, a quirky character, might be okay with this, but lots of players are not, especially from a 5e mindset in which the characters are like superheroes, such stat penalties are too off-putting. So 5th edition removes most or all of these penalties to make the kobold have more broad appeal, but that creates a new problem. Kobolds are suddenly just as strong and hardy as dwarves or humans, which that doesn't make any sense. Another issue is that kobolds are typically evil. They are classically monsters or antagonists. But to make them player characters, again, lots of people will be put off by having to play a character that, even if he is not evil, the world around him will make assumptions about him and be rude or unjust in their dealing. So then the proposed solution by D&D is that, well, not all kobolds are evil. There are plenty of neutral or good aligned ones too. And they can't be uncivilized or portrayed in some disrespectful way because they're people just like you and I. And at a certain point, I have to ask, are they even kobolds anymore? If they're stripped of too many of their defining characteristics, then it becomes just a skin. But there is another point of view, the counter argument, and it is worth consideration. Kobolds have qualities that can make for a great adventurer or a dungeon delver. They can be portrayed as resourceful and cunning, using their small size and familiarity with underground layers to their advantage in combat, in scouting, whatever kind of problem solving is needed down there. Kobolds could also be shown as having a strong sense of loyalty and community to those who manage to gain their trust, making them valuable members of a party. Having a kobold as a player character option can also add more variety to the game. It allows players to explore a new perspective and new experiences. In a game like D&D, which is a very high magic setting and the players can essentially be anything they want, it is important to offer lots of options. I think that points like this really do deserve to be considered. I'm going to say something that I've said many times before. Almost anything can be done as long as it's done well. 
You could design a game in which the characters are only humans, and it's based on just medieval European history, and things like orcs and kobolds are just absolutely evil monsters. Or you could design a game in which everything from humans and elves to hobgoblins and ettercaps are all a mixture of some good, some neutral, and some evil. And there are varieties of different societies of each, and some societies are even cosmopolitan mixtures of many different species. Both of these approaches could be done well, with interesting characters, great world building, thrilling stories, fun mechanics. The thing you want to avoid is just going totally out of balance. On the one extreme, completely ridiculing tradition, or on the other extreme, tyrannically oppressing any chance for new ideas. I myself can very much enjoy both of these approaches that I mentioned. I can work on one project that is very historical, grounded, and realistic. Then I can dive into a different project like Monstrous Heroes that's very high fantasy and allows for characters to be giant spiders and ogres and elementals. I learn something from each. I get something out of each one and I find a kind of motivating inspiration that's unique to each one. The same as how I can watch Back to the Future one day, then Last of the Mohicans the next. Or I can listen to a Mastodon album, and after that, listen to Boards of Canada. There are so many different interesting and inspiring things out there. And in there, in your imagination. So thanks for watching everyone. I'll be back with another video soon. And as always, may your adventures be many.